Okay, so this is Math 317 Introduction to Operations Research. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just have one massive file for the notes that I'm writing in class and I will just keep updating that and I will post that on the web. So you can decide exactly how much detail you want to include as I lecture. But again, anything I am writing will be saved modular, of course, computer crashes and whatnot, which I am not responsible for. All right. Uh, oh. So this weekend, uh, my daughter and I went to research uh, restaurants I worked in you know, 30 plus years ago to see just how have they changed in 30 years, uh, both just in general, as well as in response to the pandemic. And this is one of the things I really want to emphasize in a class like this is what kind of real world issues are places struggling with what kind of choices do they make and what are the trade-offs? So this is what used to be the employee parking lot in the second restaurant I worked in. It is no longer an employee parking lot. The space was far too valuable uh, because it was right by the river. Now, of course, there was the danger of your car actually going into the river if you did not do a good job parking and your brakes were not good. So they actually had to level it off a little bit. During the pandemic, they made the decision to turn this into outdoor dining. Absolutely brilliant decision. And you know, I did talk to you, so where do the employees park now? Not as ideal as it used to be. What's the big question you should be asking? Yes. What's more valuable? So one is what's more valuable? Is it the outdoor dining or is it the employee parking? Clearly, at the heart of the pandemic, it was the outdoor dining. But there's another question that you should ask. They've decided to keep this. And again, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but. So the big question is, why was it only when the pandemic hit that they came up with the idea to have outdoor dining? For decades, there was no outdoor dining. They were right by a river. You know, I'm not gonna say the name because it's being recorded. You know, if you have decent eyesight, mine isn't anymore. You, know, you can tell exactly what river it's right by. For decades, they were by the river and they did not have outdoor dining, why? You know, there's lots of explanations, inertia. You know, this is how it's done. You know, this has always been the employee parking lot. So they kept it as the employee parking lot. And just, it wasn't until an emergency happened that they revisited what they were doing. This is one of the things I really want you to get out of this course. I am not gonna be trying to throw massive amounts of information your way most of the time. Occasionally I will, of course. You know, this is a math course, we have a math prefix. I really wanna put in a few key things for you to think about. You know, oftentimes difficulties are wonderful opportunities. They force you to stop, pause, and really evaluate what you are doing. It is so easy to get caught up in doing things, well, because this is how it's always been done. And so for years, they had the opportunity to have outdoor dining and they just didn't. Yes? I think it was because before pandemic, um, the, the unemployment is kind of low, which means they, if there's uh, employee parking, it means like, and um, employees may be like 30 minutes away. Right? Okay, good. So one thing is how far away would the employees have to park? And it turns out there, there were options to have the employees park without being too far away. Um, I recently went to a conference in Sarajevo. We flew out of, JFK is the international airport, right? And so you know, we parked in one of the economy lots, which I think is technically still in the United States, but just the amount of time it took you know, to get to the airport from you. Know, walking to where you pick up the shuttle and then taking the shuttle and, and the monorail and everything. So they were, they were not a severe inconvenience to the employees, but it's absolutely something to think about. The other question of course is before the pandemic, what were people's dining preferences? How many people would be willing to eat outdoors? And you know, would there be enough to have made it worthwhile? I think so because it's such a nice view, at least you know, early in the evening, you know, it's not too bad in terms of mosquitoes and whatnot. But you know, these, are, these are questions you should be thinking. The answer might be they were doing the right thing. It might've been that for those decades, the right decision was to have the employee parking lot. But I just want this to be on your mind that when you are working in uh, industry, always be looking at what are you doing and ask why. And there are so many times when people no longer have any idea what is the cause behind something like this, or the original cause is no longer valid. 
So just always be thinking and re-imaging. All right. All right, so uh, other interesting changes, they got rid of the no smoking bump. So there used to be a room that was, you know, essentially walled off with glass, the glass is gone. Um, and then again, this is more of an interesting snapshot in terms of how society has evolved. Are there enough smokers nowadays who want to smoke during a meal that it's worth losing an entire you know, room of the restaurant, say around a third of the capacity to something like this? There are other things I could mention. The last thing I'll mention is just you know, two streets uh, near where we had a summer place when we were growing up. One is a dirt road, and I was actually surprised they actually put speed bumps on this dirt road. And the other is a paved road. And if you look very carefully in the very bad picture I took from my phone, you might notice uh, something on the paved road that's not on the dirt road. It's not a great picture, but hopefully it's big enough that you can see that there's something on the paved road that's not on the dirt road. Line. Not the line. What, 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 is, what do you see on this road that's not on that road? The car. So it was a conscious decision on the street we grew up in not to have a paved road. Why would you not want to have a paved road? Is there, like, atmosphere? So one is to preserve atmosphere. There's another reason it's related to atmosphere. To, to prevent traffic. You know, if you have a paved road, people are gonna go down your road to get to the beach. What's interesting is if you actually go to the very end of our road, it's paved at the very end because nobody's going to be coming off. The, you know, it's really more the traffic going the other direction. And so again, just always think, you know, what is behind the decision that's being made? Usually there's a good reason. Um, I was shocked to see that they put speed bumps. I didn't think that there were enough cars going down the road to merit, you know, a speed bump. But just, you know, be aware of decisions being made. All right. So now let's switch to something a little bit more mathematical. Uh, how many people have ever seen Babylonian mathematics? You all have, you just don't notice such. So the Babylonians worked base 60. So where do you see base 60 nowadays? I'm sorry? Time. Time. Yeah. 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes now, dear Lord, help us, right? Where else do you see 60 in mathematics? Degrees, right? We should always, always, always use radians when we do differential trigonometry. Because in radians, the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. This is not true if you use degrees. There's a factor of two pi over 360 or 360 over two pi, depending on how you want to do things. And the reason radians are so nice is if you have a arc of theta radians, you know, with the unit circle, then the angle, I'm sorry, if you have an angle of theta radians and it's a unit circle, then the length of the arc is theta. So it gives you that nice correspondence between the two. Anybody have any thoughts as to why the Babylonians would use base 60? And if you don't know why they use base 60, can you give me a suggestion for a better base to use? Yes. Yes, beautiful. So 60 is divided by one, by two, by three, by four, by five, by six, right? So until you get to seven that you finally get something that's not divisible. What you can do is you can look at what's called the euler totian function. Uh, phi of n is how many numbers less than or equal to n are relatively prime to n. And you can try to get a sense of, if you look at all the numbers, you know, there's a lot of different elementary number statistics you could look at, and you could try to see which number has the most distinct factors that divide us. Well, if I take larger and larger numbers, I'm going to get more and more factors if I choose things appropriately. So that's not a good metric. So maybe I look at what fraction of the numbers less than myself divide myself evenly. And you can try to see is maybe 60 a local maximum for of all numbers of a given comparable size, this is the one that has the most factors you know, around this level. Can anybody think of a better base to use? Either speak up or raise your hands. Better base to use than 60. Base 10. Yeah, base 10. Raise your hands, right? Why should we use base 10? Um, I think it's more understandable. Or, uh, 
Right, right. For us, we have fingers. We have 10 fingers. You know, so for us, we can work base 10 very easily. There's nothing, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very careful. I do not see anything in the universe that says base 10 is special. I'll leave that to the religion and the philosophy department says to, you know, there's nothing natural for base 10, except for us, we have 10 fingers. And so for us, it's very easy to use that. Uh, later in the semester, I will show you an abacus and I will show you various slide rules you know, designed to make some calculations easier. What would be a natural good base to use in the 21st century? Binary, Binary base two. Or sometimes they use hexadecimal, which is base 16. So computers love base two on, off, yes, no, true, false. It's very easy for them to work with stuff like that. So here, you know, Wikipedia, you know, fountain of all knowledge, source of all wisdom, you know, very easy to just go and look up a couple of things. You know, here are the different symbols. You know, please make sure these are memorized by now. We're not going to work with these, but it's just worth getting a sense of how they did this. Now, one of the problems of working with base 60, first of all, you've got to learn all the symbols. So this suggests that you should have a pretty good system so that you know, you're not memorizing 60 distinct symbols, but you have some very natural patterns. So when you look at this, can you figure out a pattern as to how you go along? Does it look like a natural method? I don't know if I can, yeah, I think I can zoom in a little bit. So how, how do you seem to progress? Tip that corresponds to one through nine. Yeah. Like the 10, 20s to that. Right. So, this, so the question is just it seems to be doing it symmetrically as we go down further. And so this seems to be a pretty nice pattern. And once you get to 10, that's a nice symbol, and you're putting down, and then you have 11. So even though it is base 60, there does seem to be some understanding that you know, we do have 10 fingers. Right now, they did everything with you know clay tablets and whatnot. So for those of you who complain about all the books you have to lug around and whatnot, imagine lugging around the multiplication tables. So one of the things that's great about positional arithmetic, you know, such as what we do, is it's very easy to multiply numbers once you understand how to multiply single digits and then carry. Uh, what ancient mathematical symbol would you prefer not to do multiplication in, or even addition? Roman numerals, right? It is, uh, you know, it is a disaster to try to think about doing actual serious mathematics with Roman numerals. So how many multiplications do we need to learn for base 10 versus base 60? So how bad is it? How many multiplications are needed base 10? How many needed base 60? Okay, why'd you get 81? Okay, so one is nine times nine is 81. I'm gonna push back a little bit. There's more than nine digits. I'm not saying all of these are equally difficult to learn. There's the zero, so how many is there? Why 90? So how many multiplications are there base 10? If we want to multiply two digits, how many things do I have to learn? Yes, 100, how'd you get 100? 10 by 10, okay. So if you learn 100, you'll be fine. But you know, when you quote me, there's a few things that you should have. You know, one is the hammer quote. All you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Second is if whenever you see a product, take a logarithm. And next is mathematicians are lazy. I don't want to learn 100 things. Can you give me any savings? Yes, multiplication is commutative. Order doesn't matter. So how many ways are there to multiply two-digit numbers? So why 45? Okay, so you're excluding zero. So let's put zero in. So if we do base 10, so one way to look at it is we have 10 digits. 
I can look at how many ways can I choose two distinct digits? How many ways are there to choose two distinct digits from 10? Does anybody know how to do this combinatorially? I have 10 digits, I want to choose two. Right, also known as 10 choose two, right? My basic combinatorial function, I have 10 objects, I choose two of them. Now I could have the double number. Yes? Is that with or without replacement? So this is without replacement. I'm choosing two distinct numbers. An order doesn't matter. So if I was doing division, it would be different. But because it's multiplication, order doesn't matter. How many ways are there to choose one number? 10. And so this would be how many products I can form. And the first one is going to be the peer where each element is distinct. And then the second is when I have the same number twice. So 10 choose two is gonna be 10 factorial over two factorial, eight factorial plus 10 factorial over one factorial, nine factorial. Uh, that's 10 times nine over two is 45 plus 10 is 55. So this would be two distinct. This would be the repeat. Base 60. I want to learn all of my multiplication base 60. How bad? bad. Well, let's quantify. Let's quantify how bad. You know, is this, you know, we go to the dean's office and complain about what Professor Miller gave us for homework, or is it? Okay, so how'd you get that? 60 choose two plus, and 60 choose two is? 60 times 59 divided by two. Right, so it's 30 times 59. I would just do, I would do 30 times 60, and then I would subtract 30 from that. I'm sorry, I would subtract, wait a minute. It's 30 times 59. So if I did 30 times 60, that'd be 1800, right? And then subtracting 30 from that, so it's 1770, yes. Then I would add 60, right? And just for the record, this is approximately one half of 60 squared. And one of the things that I, I really want to emphasize in this class is the order of magnitude estimates. You know, the main term here is the 60 choose two, not the 60 choose one. For small bases like 10 or two, you know, both terms could be comparable. But when you start to get large bases, the 60 choose two is so much larger than the 60 choose one, it's approximately 60 choose two. And for the 60 choose two, it's 60 times 59 over two. Oh, come on, it's 60 times 60 over two. So if you want to get a rough sense of how bad it is, uh, 3,600 divided by two, this is about 1,800. So it's actually very close. It's just a rough estimate. So if you are a young Babylonian scholar, you know, going into the family business of you know, doing the accounting, you would have to learn 1,800 digit multiplications if you wanted to be doing Babylonian mathematics. Or you could have a lookup table. Which would you rather do? Memorize 1,800 items or have a lookup table? Lookup table. Now, what is the problem with the ancient Babylonian lookup tables? It would be massive, right? You know, to be able to pull all of those with you, it's non-trivial. Now, I am old enough that I remember what was called technical manuals. You know, when you had a product, they would actually publish books on how to use it. Why don't they do that now? No. You have, you have the internet. You also have far more uh, space available on your computers and in the programs. If you look at some of the old early games, um, anybody ever see Ready Player One? No one? Yeah, they, they talk about the very first year programmer to bury his name as an Easter egg in adventure. 
where if you do various things, you can actually see little lines of code. If you go to Microsoft, I think 95, if you do a couple of very clever tabs, you enter the Hall of Tortured Souls and you see um, pictures of the programmers who worked on it. And you know, there's different views as to, you know, is it worth doing something like this? You know, is this that big of a deal? What else is being left on in the programs if they do stuff like this? There wasn't that much space back then. You know, floppy disks could store about 1.4 megabytes. And so to have all the information you needed available was non-trivial. Nowadays, it's no problem. So lookup tables now are absolutely wonderful. And we'll talk more about them later. These are great ways to do calculations efficiently. But you know, in the you know, ancient times, to carry this many things around was terrible. So any savings you can do is valuable. So a lot of advancement comes from necessity. You know, we have a problem. We need to do better. And this drives improvement. And so a lot of you know, the impetus for early lookup tables is problems like this. And nowadays, if you look at how calculators and various devices calculate things like square roots um, or, or trigonometric functions, you can put in some lookup tables so that you don't actually have to do a lot of computations. You can take pre-computed information and then adjust it very quickly. So I'm gonna show you a faster way to do multiplication. We need to first establish apples to apples, apples to oranges, you know, which do you think is worse, adding numbers or multiplying numbers in terms of the cost? Multiplying, much, much worse. You know, adding is so easy relative to, you know, if you have two numbers with a lot of digits, if you have D digits, how many digit multiplications do you have roughly? So if you have two D digit numbers and you multiply them, roughly how many operations would that be for just the multiplication? D squared, and if you're adding them roughly, how much? D, maybe 2D if you have the counting and whatnot, but you see for very large numbers, multiplication is gonna dwarf the cost of arithmetic. And so you can all say, yeah, you know, for all practical purposes, I'm not really that worried about arithmetic. I'm not really worried about addition, I'm worried about multiplication. So here is Babylonian multiplication. One of the most brilliant things I've ever seen in my life. X times Y is X plus Y squared minus X squared minus Y squared over two, or X plus Y squared minus X minus Y squared over four. When you first see this, you should think that your professor should be shot. Rather than just multiplying two numbers, in the first case, I'm gonna do three squares, two subtractions, an addition, and a division by two. In the second, I'm doing two squares, two subtractions, an addition, and a division by four. Does everyone at least agree that these formulas are correct? Why would this be a better thing to do? What is the advantage of this? In what sense? In the multiplication way, it might be easier, especially with X and Y single digit numbers to just be squaring things. So you're extremely close. I mean, if you, but you said the number of operations I'm doing, I'm doing more operations. Yes. So you only have to memorize the squares. I only need squares. So now, I only need, say, on the order of how many squares do you think? Sixty. I might go a little bit higher than sixty, because I've got x plus y. Yeah, I might go up to one hundred and twenty. So I would say I need on the order of one hundred and twenty um, items in my table. That is much better than on the order of 1800. And so again, this is the difference between pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Pure mathematics, multiply X and Y. Applied mathematics, how do I multiply X and Y? And so again, I really want to emphasize, you know, thinking about problems like this, what are you doing? How can you do things more efficiently? I think one of your homework assignments for this week is to find something you do in your life and find a way to do it better.
you know, more efficient. For me, one of the things was, there's a couple of spices I always like to put on various things that I cook for myself. And so rather than having to take out, you know, the three or four different things of spices, I've just taken one of the jars and then just dumped the spices and shaken it up. And I only have to take out my spice. So then the rest of the family has their spices and then this one here is for dad. So what are you doing that you can do more efficiently? If you're only doing something once or twice, it may not be worth it. But if you're doing something repeatedly, such as your mathematics like this, spending the time to try to find a better way of doing it will pay tremendous dividends. Okay, any questions about Babylonian mathematics? Has anybody taken, uh, say, advanced real analysis or functional analysis and seen bilinear forms? Have like, anybody seen bilinear forms? This is where you actually see things like x plus y squared minus x squared minus y squared. It's you know, a great idea that you know, if we can compute squares or like length squared, we can also compute like dot products and stuff like that. Okay. So what I want to turn to now is fast multiplication. So this was covered back when I was in ugh, middle school to early high school. I don't know if they really cover this anymore, but let's say we want to evaluate a polynomial. And again, this is the 21st century. I know what you would do is you would just plug it into your computer and have the computer evaluate. But what's a good way to evaluate the polynomial? So let's say I have you know, the polynomial 3x to the fifth minus yada, yada, yada. And I want to evaluate it, maybe x equals two. So I would put you know, two in fx and I would get three times two to the fifth minus eight times two to the fourth plus seven times two cubed. How many multiplications does it take to evaluate three times two to the fifth? So how many multiplications to calculate three times two to the fifth? Five. To calculate two to the fifth is four multiplications. I start off with two, two times two times two times two times two. So it's four multiplications and I have to multiply by three. The eight X to the fourth would be four multiplications. That's why I have five plus four plus three plus two plus one equals zero or 15. So these are the triangle numbers and you know, if it's a polynomial of degree D, then the number of multiplications is gonna be D, D plus one over two. There's a very famous formula for the sum of the first D integers. And I'll quickly go over the proof of that in a moment. I am not worrying about addition. We are basically saying addition is so much easier than multiplication that for the point of uh, today's lecture, we will assume addition is essentially free. Okay. And so there's many ways of proving this. How many of you have heard the story of you know, Gauss when he was five. So the story is that the teacher was just having one of those days and once you become a teacher, you know what this is like and wanted the young brats to shut up. So told them, okay, add the numbers from you know, one to a hundred. You're expecting that you know, he would have you know, some time to just recover. And then Gauss immediately yells out you know, 5,050. And the way Gauss did this is you know, nowadays we would often do this by proof by induction. You take the numbers one through D call that some S of D and then write it backwards. And then when you add vertically, one plus D is D plus one, two plus D minus one is D plus one. So each vertical sum is D plus one. We have D of them. So it's D times D plus one, but we've counted every number twice. We have to divide by two. The disadvantage of this proof is if I want you to add the sum of the first D squares or cubes or fourth powers, it doesn't generalize. There are tricks you can do, however, and you know, still make it work, but it's not gonna work nearly as well. And so we often prove these things by induction. Okay, so the number of uh, multiplications is going to be D, D plus one over two. So we often talk about what's the order, what's the complexity. And so if D is a large number, and in applications, D might actually be a 200 or 400 digit number if we're doing modern encryption, you know, D squared is so much larger than D that we could essentially say, ah, it's about D squared over two. You're very similar to what we were doing earlier today. All right, here is the faster way of multiplying, I'm sorry, of evaluating a polynomial. How many people have heard of Horner's algorithm? Okay, this is one of my absolute favorite um, methods in mathematics. So I am going to not give the Full proof, I'm going to just prove by example, this is not a valid proof technique, but you should be able to fill in the details. And so it is beautifully color-coded. 
And so what we do is we do three X minus eight, and then we multiply that by X and then we add seven. Then we multiply that by X and add six. Then we multiply by X and subtract nine, and then we multiply by X and add two. And if you look at what goes on, you know, the three X, I got to choose a color I haven't used before. Let's see. Let me try to use like Williams purple. So the three X here hits this X and then it hits this X and then it hits this X and then it hits this X. And that's going to give us a three X to the fifth. And then you can look and see what does the negative eight do. And the negative eight is going to give us a negative eight X to the four and so on and so on. So the advantage of doing it like this is we've greatly reduced the number of multiplications. How many multiplications do we have now? Five. So now this is order D multiplications. Versus the order say D squared over two. So there's a tremendous savings when you know, D is large. And again, in a lot of applications, D will be large and this will be tremendously valuable. So again, from a theoretical point of view, there's no need to do any of this. But from a practical application, uh, when you're trying to compute things in real time, this can be, make all the difference. Unfortunately, in applications, uh, you might have D of size 10 to the 200. you could have a tremendously large number like that. If you have something of size 10 to the 200, we have no hope of doing anything like that. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the number of objects in the universe is between 10 to the 80 and 10 to the 90. So if you have a universe of universes that gets you to maybe 10 to the 180, running since the dawn of time, maybe a little bit more than 10 to the 200. So there's no way we're going to be able to do, you know, problems like this. And so the question is, can you do better than Horner's algorithm? And this is a real theme, both for this class and post Williams. When you have something that you're doing multiple times, think, you know, just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean this is the best way to do it. Maybe there's a more efficient, better way to do it. One of the greatest problems is that if you try to ask for too much, it's gonna be hard because I want something that's gonna work for every polynomial you're not gonna get something that works well for every polynomial. But maybe if you choose a special polynomial, maybe for special polynomials, there's better ways to evaluate. So can anybody give me a very special polynomial of degree D? That maybe this polynomial I can evaluate easily. Any thoughts? What would be a good polynomial of degree D? Any thoughts? What might be a good polynomial to try of degree D? Yes, X to the D. It is the simplest possible polynomial that satisfies my condition that it must be a polynomial of degree D. Maybe there's a nice way to evaluate a monomial. That you know, as soon as I have all these terms that I have to have interacting with each other, there's problems. Before going to x to the d, let's just look at what's going on. When we were evaluating it naively, okay, we calculate nine times x, not a big deal. Now we calculate x squared multiplied by six. Now we calculate x cubed. It seems foolish to calculate x cubed by going x times x times x, when just a moment ago we calculated x squared. So the whole point of Horner's algorithm is to just keep track of, hey, don't keep computing everything from scratch. All right, so let's see if there's a better polynomial to look at. All right, um, so we'll do that in a second. I, I guess I wanted to just show pictures. Um, anybody ever do fuse beads? All right, my daughter and I did the fuse bead on the left. It's the Mandelbrot set. We'll talk a little bit more about this later in the semester. When you try to calculate certain fractals, these are extremely difficult calculations. I remember writing code to do this back when I was in high school and I had to switch to Horner's algorithm to get it to even run slowly on the computers from about 30 years ago. And so these small little uh, changes were essential. Okay, so we said, maybe this polynomial is slightly better. And we said, maybe we should try a polynomial of the form x to the d or x to the n. So I always choose my value of n to be 100. 
And the idea is to use binary. So I'm going to write 100 in base 2. So it's 64 plus 32 plus 4. So the subscript 2 over there means I'm writing things in binary. This is my 1's digit, my 2's digit, my 4's digits, my 8's digits, and so on and so on. Any Futurama fans here? Uh, wonderful show. It's by the makers of The Simpsons. They go to great lengths to encode math jokes. And there's a beautiful episode involving uh, a character who inherits a haunted house. And they see a number in red in binary. And they ask the robot, what does it mean? They have absolutely no idea. And then later he sees the number reflected in a mirror and he starts screaming and runs out of the house. It's 666, the number of the beast written in binary backwards. Yeah. Very few TV shows will go to this length for a math joke. When you write things in different bases, you have to be clear what's going on. As soon as I see a seven as one of my digits, okay, I know I'm not writing something in base six or lower because I have a seven. But if I just give you the number 1100100, how do I know what base it is? And so this is really good notation, a subscript too. You normally wouldn't put a subscript by a number. So when you're thinking about how you want to denote things, really spend time thinking about what is good notation. I like this notation for representing things in different bases. All right, so let's see how we can multiply things better in binary. So what we're going to do is x times x is x squared, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, x to the fourth times x to the fourth is x to the eighth, all the way down to x to the 64th. We don't have to go beyond x to the 64. That would give us x to the 128. We know that's not one of the factors. Because we know um, x to the 100 is x to the 64, x to the 32, x to the fourth. So now that I've created my table, I can now calculate x to the 100. And the way I do that is I take my x to the 64. I then multiply by x to the 32, and then I multiply by x to the fourth. So the number of multiplications, it takes one, two, three, four, five, six multiplications to construct the table, then a seventh to multiply x to the 64 by x to the 32, and then an eighth to multiply by x to the fourth. So does anybody want to guess in general, if I give you an n, roughly you know, what's the worst case number of multiplications it would need to calculate x to the n. Yes. Log base two. Yeah. Okay, log base two of what? Seven. No. I'm calculating x to the n. Log base two of n. Right? Almost. You're off by a factor. So it's essentially the log base two of n to calculate the table. But then I might have to multiply everything upwards, right? So what would be the total cost, worst case? Not n, two. Calculate the table is log n, base two, and then multiplying everything going up. So this is worst case. A lot of times when we do our analysis, we always do a worst case analysis. You could do best case analysis, but that's very optimistic. You could do average case. You could do say maybe 99% of the time it'll be this bad or better. But for a lot of things, it's nice to know what's the worst possibility. Now, if you had to multiply everything, let's say I gave you X to 127, what's a better way of calculating X to the 127? Change your perspective. So if we were to do this, we'd have to calculate the entire table and then multiply everything going up. How else could we calculate X to the 127? 127 is probably not a coincidentally chosen number. When you're thinking base two, when you hear 127, what do you really think of? X to the 128, and then what do I do? Knock off an X, divide by X. So depending on where the number is, it might actually be better to overshoot and then correct. So in terms of you know, trying to make the algorithm a little bit better, now you have to worry about you know, what are the issues with the coding? I now have to do division, but it's always going to be nice division. 
it might be better to overshoot and come down. And so you might now, you've discovered signed decompositions where I'm not gonna write X um, as the sum of powers, but maybe a sum and difference of powers, because that might work out easily, uh, a little bit better. Related to this, um, your Horner's algorithm took order D squared. I'm sorry, naive evaluation took order D squared. Horner's algorithm took order D. Fast multiplication takes order log of D. Much, much better. So if I give you a number of size 10 to the 400, the log of 10 to the 400 is 400 log 10. Anybody know roughly what the log of 10 is base E? Although actually we're technically doing things base two. So what's the log of 10 base two roughly? Look at three point something, right? 10 is more than eight, the log of eight base two is three. 10 is less than 16, the log of 16 base two is four. So the log of 10 base two is somewhere between three and four. Let's round up to four. So if I give you the log base two of 10 to the 400, that's 400 log 10, that's at most 1600. That's not too bad for a computer. A computer can do 1600 multiplications. This was the basis or is the basis of encryption schemes like RSA, which allow us to do very fast encryption and decryption. But it is worth looking and being aware of the cost. When you multiply X by X by X by X by X by X by X, I'm not required to store that much information. You know, I just keep my running product and I keep adding one term at a time. Here, I've had to create the entire table. So a better way of doing this, which will save you is the following. I can do you know, storage. I can do, um, I start off with one and X. Um, I'll do X and one. And then X times X is X squared. Neither X nor X squared is part of the um, X to the 100 is X to the 64, X to the 32, X to the four. So I keep the second component still as a one. Now I do X to the fourth. Ah, X to the fourth is one of the factors I need. So my second term is now gonna be next to the fourth then x to the fourth times x to the fourth is x to the eighth. That doesn't occur, so I keep this as an x to the fourth. Then I would have x to the 16th, x to the fourth. Then x to the 32nd. Ah, I do need the 32nd, so this would become x to the 36th. And then I would have x to the 64, x to the 100. So this is a way to cut down on my storage cost. I don't have to actually construct the entire table. I just have to keep you know, a running collection of what I need. So again, when you do problems like this, it's really worth thinking about what are the different trade-offs you're going to have to do. You know, some methods might require a little bit more memory. Do you have the memory available so that this is a good trade? Anybody know how much uh, RAM their computers have these days? Is that reasonable for most people here? Order of magnitude and your base two order of magnitude. Okay. When I was young, the first computer I had that I could program, you know, my, my dad splurged and he bought the extension so we could get up to 16 kilobytes of RAM. When things are so cheap, you don't really have to worry so much about it. And you know, again, a lot of times, it's, is it really worth you know, dealing with stuff like this? No. Uh, for many things, it's not. But other times, it will make a difference. You know, there are some uh, projects I've done with students. And you know, for those of you who are not graduating, if you are interested in summer research, we have a series of teams every year in the math stats department. And I'm happy to talk more about that, where the computations took somewhere between three and six months to finish. And you know, when it's that long, you spend a lot of time thinking about every efficiency you can get. And you do some simple cases first to just make sure that you can trust everything. All right, so what we're going to do for the next class is we're going to do Strassen's algorithm. And so this is going to be 
revisiting things you have done for many, many years. It will also allow me to review a little bit of linear algebra. So one of the reasons I didn't fully prepare everything for this class is I want to get a sense of what are people's backgrounds. And so I want to review a few things from linear algebra. Um, you know, we don't have that much time right now, so I don't want to go into too much. Everyone here has at least seen how to multiply matrices. You know, the question is, why would anyone ever choose to have this as the definition of matrix multiplication? There's a couple of ways of viewing what's going on. One way of viewing a matrix is it's a transformation. And we're just writing down what the transformation does. So it's a function. It takes maybe in two dimensions, x, y as input and gives you a new x, y as output. Well, depending on how you write things down, the transformation can look different. And so really, whenever you write down a matrix for a transformation, you have to choose two bases. One is the basis of the input vector, and the second is the basis of the output vector. And if you remember your linear algebra, uh, depending on who you had, you might remember some very painful calculations where you're trying to write down what is the matrix going to be that does this in this basis. You know, we're not going to get into too much detail about that, but we are going to talk about well, how do you multiply two um, matrices. And so we'll start off by talking about um, maybe if I give you, should we try? Okay. You know, so maybe I give you some vector and I want to know what happens. Well, one of the big ideas in linear algebra is the notion of a coordinate system and a notion of you know, basis vectors. As a Bostonian, I hate New York, but I have to admit that there is one part of New York that does something better than Boston. If you say the wrong thing right now, a certain wrong thing will have you get an F for this class. What do I have to tip my half off to part of New York over Boston? The grid system, the grid system in Manhattan the beautiful north, south, east, west, as opposed to Boston where you have roads crossing each other multiple times. And so you have beacon hit and continent. So we can write things down. So if I give you a general vector, say V as X, Y, I can write it as X times one zero plus Y times zero one, or maybe as X E one plus Y E two. And then what we can do is we can talk about your know, matrices are going to be a linear transformation. So, you know, so A of V would be A X E one plus A Y E two would be X A of E one plus Y A of E two. And this is what leads to how we construct what it means for a a matrix to act on a vector, a matrix to act on a vector. If we want, if I have A acting on a vector and then I have B following it, what should be the matrix for A, B? Well, actually, I guess in this case it would be B, A. And so this is going to lead to, if I have, you know, A, B, C, D, X, Y, this will become A, X plus B, Y, C, X plus D, Y, you can really view this as AC with my X plus my BC with a Y. And this is how the matrix is acting. And so I will stop here and then we will do uh, matrices multiplying each other. And then we'll talk about how can you efficiently multiply matrices. And this is extremely important for lots of applications. All right, I will stop here.